Good morning. Smaller crowd this morning. We do have a few people out, which is okay. Because you're always, whoever's supposed to be here is here this morning, right? Amen. So I know we're under, as you guys know, big transition in the church. You pray for us as we're praying about moving forward and, and seeing where the God or where the Lord wants to lead us. Um, we, we do have a great opportunity to set a uh, great example because the fact that, you know, most people that step down move on, and, but they are part of the family. No, we're just going to, they're going to step down from one role to really engage in another role. And so, um, um, yeah, so we are, but we're praying, we're praying about how, what God wants to do, and we want to continue to pray, and you guys pray with us because we want to, the Lord has a plan. He's always had a plan, and we want to make sure we hear correctly. So you guys pray for us. Let me pray this morning. This is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to tell a little bit of my story this morning as I was just praying about today and, and, and kind of looking through some of my journals. I was going to tell you a little bit about the guy who stands up here occasionally and speaks and kind of give you a little bit of my story. For one, that to let you know the faithfulness of God and that the promises of God are yes and amen and that what God declares, he will finish. And the work that he starts, he will complete. And, and some of that through me, and some, some, maybe some of you guys will get hope for yourself, hope for your kids, hope for your loved ones, just hearing a little bit of our story. Because as we bear witness, as we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and it's yet to be seen if I love my life not unto death. But the, the first two, I'm trying to knock it out of the park, okay? Lord Jesus, we are, uh, we're all here because of you and your great and mighty awesome plan, Lord. We we didn't pick where we are. You did. We didn't choose to be. You did. We are so valuable in your eyes, Lord, before anything ever was. Everyone here was in your mind already created, waiting for the day that the word would be spoken and we would appear upon this earth for your glory, for your pleasure. And, Lord, in the end, in all of our stories, because all, all of us have a story, in the end, Lord, you will be declared victorious and receive all the glory, Lord Jesus. So may I glorify you, Lord, this morning with a little bit of my story. And may others receive hope and encouragement in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So first I got a picture of my, my daughter and son-in-law here, Emmanuel. I want us to pray because I'm going to pray first. And if anybody else is sick, he's really sick. He got real, real, real sick. The sickest Bethany's ever seen him in the last few days. And so Bethany was even scared yesterday. Um, so, hey, we face things. We're not surprised at the fiery trial that comes our way, right? So we're going to pray. But the Lord did tell us to pray. We have great power in our prayer. When we partook of the cup, us believers in Christ, we partook of the cup, we were washed clean as we came to Jesus. Therefore, our prayers are powerful and effective. Amen. So anybody else that's, that's sick, we're just going to, Think about them, mention their names, okay? Lord Jesus, this morning, Lord, as we're all just come before you, Jesus, we know that you're here in the midst of us, Lord, regardless what we feel your word declares, where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst. Lord, you give us great authority and power in your name. Lord, I lift up my son-in-law, Emmanuel, Lord. You, you are not surprised by any of this, Lord. We call upon you, Lord Jesus, to extend your hand, to speak the word, as a centurion told you, Lord, in person upon this earth, you just speak the word, Lord, and my servant will be healed. Lord, speak the word. Speak the word from heaven and heal my son-in-law. And all those in this body, Lord, that, that, have, that are sitting here today that are sick, that are dealing with issues, Lord, or know of others that are dealing with issues, Lord. We have authority as your sons and daughters to come right into the throne room, to right into your presence and lift them up to you. And you listen and you hear us. And we thank you for that. I thank you that you hear our prayers, and we believe, Lord, that you act upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We have great authority in Jesus' name. So, oh, Lord, hang on. Try to start my stopwatch. Before I came up here, my wife goes, are you zipped? She always making sure I'm not. <laughs> check my britches, check my pants. <laughs> 
get all, you know, I get all, my, Lord, she said, I get all my keys and everything out of my pocket. She said, if I got something in there, I always fiddle with it. So I get everything out. And then she said, you stand up here and just spin your ring. <laughs> Whatever. I'm always got to be moving. <laughs> okay. Lord, may we honor you, Lord. We all have a great story. So um, I want to say this, that though my story has a different My story started when my parents, who were grown, got saved and started to instruct and teach us. So maybe you grew up in a Christian home, maybe you didn't, maybe you just now come to the Lord. It doesn't matter. Once you become a child of God, all the promises that are in this word and are made known to everybody are yours then. You are just as you can begin to call upon God to correct things in your past that might have been done wrong that you didn't know about, that you were ignorant of. Maybe you were lost and your kids grew up and they're lost now. You can begin now as a child of God to call upon God. He, he has so much power. He can go back and fix things. That's just part of my story. When I was a little boy around four or five years old, mom and dad got saved during the, kind of during the Jesus movement of the 70s um, and began to We never really belonged to a structured church. We were always a part of just Bible study groups that were just here and there and meeting everywhere. And just, we were kind of just around a bunch of different kinds of Christians. (laughs) Some that had, they were just pretty different in their beliefs and strange. And, and, uh, but it was just a wild time during that era of the 70s. I was born in 1967. I'm 56. And, uh, but as a little boy, I didn't know to doubt, you know, and I, and I want to encourage moms and dads in here. Just, just teach the kids. Just, just read them the scriptures. Tell them about what God does, even if you're struggling with it. <laughs> They've not reached the age where they reason with a lot of stuff. So I didn't know to doubt. Um, um, a couple of instances, uh, um, well, I will share this. When, uh, during this time, my dad is a young Christian. Um, about a year old into the Lord, was going to quit a big manufacturing plant that he worked at and go out into business for himself. And, but he was really struggling because there was insur- he was insured, fully insured with the, with the manufacturing company, but he w- if he stepped out on his own, he would not be able to afford the insurance. Well, as his little boy, I was just about deaf at about four or five years old, before I started school, so maybe about three and four. I, couldn't, I could hear if I got right in your face, and some of you have heard me say this before, and you could speak real loud I could listen to you, but I had to look right in your face and kind of read your lips. But dad, now this is outside of me. This is just dad had to, he wrestled, as you can imagine. He feels like he's supposed to start his own business, but he's wrestling with the Lord and wrestling in his faith and wanting to trust God, but he's leaving the insurance. The insurance would have paid for surgeries that would have tried to fix my problem. But something came upon dad, a moment when he just... (laughs) faith would descended on him i don't know how to describe it when when he just said lord i'm going to trust it and put it into your hands and he did and he stepped out and started his own company i don't remember the all i remember is one day i still get chills it's funny <laughs> i just remember one day playing in the yard and instantly could hear everything and so i ran into the house and i said mama mama i can hear i can hear and she goes what I can hear, and so she actually put me against the wall and took a pen <laughs> and dropped it, and I could turn and hear it. And so to this day, I have excellent hearing, excellent hearing, and I try to protect it. I wear earplugs when I'm working. So God, so I grew up kind of knowing these things, you know. So don't be afraid to step out sometimes. We need to, to trust the Lord more. When I was about nine years old, so you know, during this time, mom and dad have their own story. And it, there's a lot of tragedy that came and a lot of rescuing by the Lord. Because the Lord is still in the rescuing business, people. Especially his kids that he already spoke over and gave a word over. But at one point, we, uh, I was about nine years old and we go fishing. And uh, we caught a lot of fish. We'd drive through you, in, there where we lived. I grew up in central Texas. You open several gates and go through these different, we called them tanks in Texas. They were stock tanks. In Arkansas, y'all call them ponds, but we call them tanks, you know. You push up a dam of dirt, and you collect all the water, and that was a tank, you know. <laughs> Ponds were little goldfish things in your backyard. We had tanks, you know. Um, people got baptized in tanks in Texas. So um, we went fishing in a tank in a big pond, and we caught a bunch of fish. I was all excited. And going home, I'm the one hopping out and shutting the, opening and closing the gates. Well, I was nine years old. I hopped out on a great big copperhead. It was a real big one. 
jumped on him, and he bit me in the left ankle right here. Buried his fangs. Now, you can say what you want, but as a little nine-year-old boy, I felt the poison. I know he filled me. And so I looked at Daddy and said, Daddy, a snake bit me. And so Dad jumps out of the truck, runs and grabs me, just throws me in, and then he just tears out. I think the story goes, Mom had been praying. She knew something was up. She was standing outside. Dad swung by, picked up her and uh, my sister and my little brother who was already with us. And we take off to the hospital. Now, as a nine-year-old boy, I don't remember a lot of the conversation. I remember some of the things that were happening in that moment. I remember telling Dad, it's like a yellow jacket. I can't knock off my leg. It just keeps, it was hurting. And uh, Christy's asking Mom, is he going to die? Is he going to die? Is he going to die? And Mom, they were scared. You know, we didn't have that much knowledge about snake bites. But, but we just knew that I was a little skinny little nine-year-old boy. We needed to get me to the hospital. So as they're tearing off to the hospital... They said all I was talking about was the fish we had caught. And so mom says at one point, she turned back and said, Daryl, are you scared? And she said, I went, no, mom, I prayed to Jesus. Man, I wish I still had that. And then I went on with the fish. So they get me to the hospital. They fill the trash bag, a black trash bag, because I remember. They filled it full of ice, and they laid it on my leg. And they came back and doing tests. And they, did, they kept me there most of the night. It, it never swelled. Now, if you talk to herpetologists, zoologists, or whatever, they'll say there's sometimes snake bites when it doesn't inject any venom. Well, that would be a miracle in itself. Um, but uh, also, but I felt, I know what I felt as a little boy. And I know how God had already been, been, uh, um, working in my life you know I just didn't have a reason to doubt these are things that I can call upon and so um, okay when I was 14 about this time dad got really disappointed with the church and the movements and all that was going on and hey that's just part of our story he has a story God rescues all of us but part of my story as a young man was we quit going to church. We started doing one Bible study a week that, that eventually petered out. But at 14 years old, I really sensed God move upon my life in such a way that the Lord came. Because God, what he began in me as a little boy, what he begins in all the little kids, what he speaks and, and deposits in there, he's faithful to watch it grow. Well, I, I can remember as a little bitty dude comparing cuss words in my mind, but what, which one's the worst? Because I had uncles and granddads that just, a granddad that cussed like, I mean, just really, everything was cussing. It was just natural language. But I, I would try to determine which one's the, the worst ones, but I would, I would block my mind from even thinking cuss words. And when I was a little boy, because I had taught, I was taught to trust God, that I just would pray and God would answer my prayers. I didn't have any reason to doubt. Um, at 14, the Lord really moved upon my life. Dad bought me a Bible and uh, put my name on it and and then what I remember from that was I just went right into the world I was really insecure I was trying to be everybody else's friend I was trying to do what was cool to fit in but I just really wasn't cool at that point in my life and uh, but uh, and so I just began to dad pulled us out of church and then we were just he pulled us and we moved in on a dead end dirt road out in the country and he said you know what I'll just raise my family just us and the Lord and we'll just be an island to ourselves." and uh but we were all going to school, so I began to be influenced by what? School and friends and all these things in Central Texas. And so then came years of wilderness, and I did all the bad things that country boys and, and beer and alcohol blended together with a bunch of other country boys would do. You know, you chase girls, you get in fights, and you do all that kind of stuff. Um, I always do, though. See, here's the thing about it. Um, raise a child up. We've heard this a lot. Raise a child up in the way he should go. When he's old, it shall not depart from him. Um, or he shall not depart from it. That's what the Bible says, right? Now, I've heard it said, really, that means it shall not depart from him. And I think that's true in my life because what it was, I always had this conscience that was, so don't give up, parents. There was always something that would just, and I would drink it away. I could drink it and it'd get distant out there and then I'd become who I my alternate personality, you know, that beer made me. Um, but I couldn't get away from it, so I always knew. Um, 
And then around when I'm about, uh, t well, whatever it was when I was 91, it was January 1st, 91, early 20s, the Lord began to just, so here's another thing too. Mom and dad had gotten a, our, our family life came so bad, mom and dad got a divorce. Mom moved to Kentucky, dad moved to Arkansas, I'm left in Texas. That's when God decided to go to work on me. And so it doesn't matter. Nobody has to be around your kids or these people we're praying for when God begins to work. Because I had nobody. In fact, I look back and go, Mom said it must have been grandmother's prayers before she died that just, or, or grandma, at that time, grandma was still alive. It was a grandmother's prayers that were just reaching her kids and her grandkids. And they, just, they just never stopped going. I'm all by myself, and the Lord began to just bring conviction and bring conviction. And, uh, and finally, there came the day in, in January 1st, 1991, I knelt on the floor because conviction back and forth had been going on for months. And I finally just knelt on the floor and just cried out to God. I don't remember what I said. I do remember a lightness. It just felt like a wind blew everything off of me, and I just, I was born again. And uh, uh, God took me from darkness to light. And, and I just began to have a hunger that built in me. You know, the Lord began to speak to me. I didn't go to church for months, but God was working on me. Don't ever give up on your kids. See, I know it. When I see kids that come in here before and have ventured away, I see the conviction that's on them because the Lord knows what he's doing. And, uh, but I, the Lord began to talk to me. And I would, the stuff, I'd be watching TV and I'd, I'd feel something inside go, what you're watching is taking you away from me. Oh, I'd turn it off. And what you're listening to on the radio or the tapes. Man, I took my tapes out and beat them with a hammer back when we had the little tapes, you know, just, just trying to get close to God. And, and uh, anyway, um, and then, I, and then anyway, long story, I'm moving forward. I'm, I'm learning to grow in my faith. God, I moved to Arkansas. I get saved. I leave, I leave Texas where I'm from. I leave it all behind, move up here to Arkansas, and I uh, began to ask for God for a wife. I said, Lord, I, ne I don't know how to meet good girls. I don't know how to meet godly girls. But I said, you do. You know, you know. And, and though I had everybody in the world was trying to take me out to their church, and my sister was trying to get me to go to church, I said, I know somebody. I, wanted to, I wouldn't go anywhere. I said, Lord. And dad one day gets mad and goes, Daryl, 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 there's not some girl going to come walking down the road and go, here I am to answer your prayer. You're going to have to get out there and meet some. I said, I, I, I said, okay, dad, whatever. And I was like, Lord, I don't know how to do that. I don't want to just, I just want to know it's you. Well, we get a phone call um, around about that time that uh, um, there's, a, there's a youth group out of Texas coming up camping at White Rock. And there's a group out of Alabama coming up camping at White Rock. And some people said, hey, won't y'all come up here? There's some people camping, and, and you can meet some other people from other churches, and you can make some new friends. So we went up there, and uh, that's where I was introduced to Debbie. And so um, I won't go into all that, but, but God knew what he was doing. God brought a girl out of, Central, out, out of East Texas, Amen. let us meet, and... Uh, um, I moved, I ended up moving from Arkansas to Emory, Texas. We lived there about two and a half years, married. And then in 1995, uh, March of 1995, Deb and I moved here. We just knew the Lord was moving us on. She was pregnant with my son, our son Joel at the time. And um, he was born the following October. But in, in March of 1995, we moved here when the sanctuary was over here. And this is where we've been in church ever since. Um, I had a, a, a terrible, terrible low self-esteem, but God used this church to, to break all of that off and just build his, his uh, character in me through the years and uh, um, built my confidence. Lear I learned to find my confidence in the Lord and not in what people thought, not people outside the church and, and all these other things you go through if you deal with insecurity. And, and, uh, but... Um, um, Eventually, the point in 1999, Deb and I became, through some things I felt like the Lord showed me, I went to Craig and said, look, Craig, I'm just seeing these weird little things in my, in my uh, prayer time about this little tiny little youth group. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I did not like teenagers. It's funny because I really didn't like teenagers. <laughs> but I saw this little, and all I can describe is during my prayer time, I saw this little, little group of tiny, little four or five kids, and it was like a little starburst. I'm like, heck was that well it happened the second time and i go to meet craig i said craig i don't know what's going on but I, weird things happening when i pray i see these little group of kids and 
and just a little puff of light, and they're all gone. I said, I don't know what is going on. And, he, and Craig's just like, oh, really? Well, okay, why don't you, uh, I'm going to come ask you to come. At that time, they were filling in as youth leaders, too, back when they were pastoring and doing the youth. And um, I didn't know that the elders had been praying that God would call somebody forth from the body and into that position. Craig said, hey, why don't you come down here? And I remember Megan being there. And uh, Megan stared daggers through me. That's another story, too. But, uh, um, and Craig said, I just want you to sit in. He sat in. He said, hey, Deb and I went home and said, whatever that was, we missed it. We ain't coming back. Craig called and said, hey, why don't you just come back next week, talk to the kids. I won't be there. You won't be pressured. And, and then we'll see what happens. He never came back for six and a half years. So we were stuck with it. So, but but I, I want to say something, too, in all that. During that time, I was so hungry for God in those days. When I got saved, I was so jealous, zealous for the Lord. And I, I wanted to be, every book I read was my call. Everything I tried to be like everybody else, because I, I knew God was not really pleased with Daryl. So I, everybody I read about, I tried to be like them. And that's just kind of the way I grew up. I tried to fit in with whatever group would accept me, you know. And, uh, um, but I knew God wasn't pleased with me, so I tried to be like everybody else. But also, I remember during that time, a guy came to me about the time we were really taking off in the youth, and, and he said, I pray you don't become part of the machine. And, and what happened over a few years was I did become, let me describe it like this. I got so caught up in trying to be a youth leader, and, pat, and I would look at all these, because boy, you could start getting online in those days and really look up youth leaders and youth ministries. You know, all the big flashy ones, just you could never compare. But we tried. I tried. We'd take them to conferences, these big flashy conferences and all this stuff. And I'm not saying good or bad. I would do things a lot different nowadays. But, uh, but I just got caught up in the machine of it. And out of that, I lost my closeness with the Lord. And ministry became an idol me um and burnout set in a guy who used to be man when you said jesus i'd get chills i told deb when we were in when we were engaged y'all heard me say this we're never going to have kids and we're going to live in a mud hut in africa and uh um because i just knew what god was calling me to i was not going to waste my life i was going to spend my life in the kingdom of god and finish well um, the Lord had other plans, as y'all can obviously see. But, uh, but all that began to set in, and just disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. When I saw kids that weren't responding like I thought they should, you know, it's usually a sign there's a problem with the leader, not with the, those being led. Remember that. You can never, water can't rise above its source. So what I wasn't getting with God, see, I wasn't getting it from him and pouring it out. I was getting it with me and trying to feed them and calling them into being something that they, they couldn't do because I wasn't going to the Lord. And because I wasn't, because I didn't know the Lord that well intimately, it was just hit and miss that I was decaying. I was shriveling. And, uh, and when burnout began to set in, and I didn't realize it. And so, you know, we announced the time we were going to step down, uh, in 1996, no, 2006, 2006. So we went from 99 to 2006 as the youth leaders. January the 1st, I stepped down. Um, the Lord was faithful in all of this, that when I stepped down, he provided the job that I have today, working for Rick Mooney Construction. Um, and, uh, but then became years of spiral. All I, I know is that I asked God one day, I said, Lord, show me how bad it is. And I felt like he just pulled the rug out from under me, and all I saw was blackness and depth of despair. And I went to a spiral of misery, misery, and misery. And darkness that I didn't know was in my heart, the Lord just showed it all. And then it just, you know, some of you guys know some of this, some of you don't. I'm just telling you a little bit of my story. Um, it just got, I just sunk into the depths of despair. I couldn't sing hardly on a Sunday morning. I still came to church because I was not going to take my kids out of church. I was not going to take, take my family out of church. I kept them coming. I might not be able to sing, but I kept, them, I, kept, I kept coming to church. And deep inside, 
I didn't, I did not want to serve God anymore. It was too hard. I failed. I've already, you couldn't give me anything that I did not know. You couldn't tell me anything that I did not know because I had seen it all. I had done it all. I'd read all the books. I've watched all the videos. I've been to conferences, man. I, I did what I thought. I used to fast and pray that God would make me a man of God, thinking that by fasting and praying, I was going to, oh gosh, I'm going to overcome my flesh. And nothing worked. Nothing worked. And so I lost all hope. I was in total despair. But there was something deep inside that wanted to want to serve God again. I wanted to want to serve God. But I just didn't know how. But because God, it says in Psalms 119, Forty-nine. Remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. Your promise preserves my life. What God started. Oh, I thought that was mine. <laughs> See, Paul said in Philippians, and here's the thing about it. When I was a little boy and all the things God did in me, was all that a loss? All the things? No. See, God knew what he was doing. So, Paul said in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, this is Paul speaking, being confident of this, that what God, he, God began, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of the Lord Jesus. That God who started the work in you, that God who started the work in me, he is faithful to complete it. So, so I went into the pits of despair, you name it. I was just, I just thought I was hopeless. But I did get to the point where I thought maybe I could just slide into the, I, I did think maybe I could come into the kingdom with the smell of smoke about my garments. But that would be the only way. And I don't want to, for you guys that have heard, just bear with me. Let, let me just, I'm just, I'm bearing witness to what God has done. I began, to, I began to get up early and just, just when it was just over, when it was so much despair, I began to look for anything that would give me hope. Every week I would leave Arkansas when I was working out of town. So I would leave on a Monday morning, come back on a Friday night. Y'all, a lot of you heard me say this. I'm driving east on 40 and right there around the Mulberry exit, whatever that exit is, there's that cross. Anybody know what that cross is that sits there? Well, every morning when I'm driving, it's dark. Well, I remember the first morning I just happened to notice it. All these years I didn't notice it. Well, this morning I noticed it. And something about that cross began to give me hope. I don't know what it was. The cross of Jesus began to give me hope. Some man puts a cross upon a hill, puts lights on it, and people are like, what is that going to do? Well, I'll tell you what it did for me. It began to give me hope. If God tells you to put a cross in your yard or put a sign on your door, do it. Because you never know who it's speaking to. And it got to where every Monday morning as I'm driving east, I would move, I would slow down or speed up to get the semis out of the way so I could start watching that cross. Start watching that cross. Start watching that cross. Then one day when I'm, I'm working in Lake Village, which is south of Pine Bluff, I'm driving down there just in one of those just depressing mornings. Noni Small calls me. I'm on the phone with Noni Small. And Noni goes, Daryl, when you turn, your family's going to turn with you. Gave me some encouraging words. I hung up the phone going, turn? I don't know how to turn. I've been trying to turn. But see, what she's saying is, and here's the word, your God has not forgot you. What he started, he's going to call it back. The word would have been, he's going to turn you, boy. He's going to turn you and give you hope like you have never dreamed. But I just thought, Lord, I've started getting hope. And I'd still look at that cross. And then there was a time, y'all have heard me say, I'm coming, I'm coming back home on a, on a Friday night and there's a thunderstorm behind me. And lightning, I passed that cross and I look in the mirror and lightning struck and there was that cross. It just planted like lightning struck behind that cross right there in my rear view mirror. Just like planted it. And there was something that from a pole on a hill with lights on it began. I began to get up. I began to sit. I've always been a morning guy. I'd sit in there when the rest of the family was asleep. And I started just listening to Christian songs and weeping, weeping. One particular song was this guy from uh, South Africa, a worship leader, and he would sing this song that uh, is called, it's titled, In Jesus' Name, I Have Tried 
I don't know how. If I could have done it, I'd have done it by now. I'm full of holes, and I don't know how to fill the space. And it's a cry. And I would sit and weep and weep and play that song over and over again. God was calling his boy home. God has not forgotten you or any of your kids. Call him up on his word. Remember your words, your servant, Lord. As I'm looking at that video, y'all, know, some of you really know this story. There's a man that the, the Angus Buckin, who's the movie Faith Like Potatoes, portrayed his life. At that song, they're just, it's a men who went to a conference he was speaking at in South Africa with 250,000 men in a field. And Angus is just telling his story. He's the one speaking. But in this video clip, there's pictures of him standing there. And there comes this picture of him standing in a flannel shirt, a farmer's hat on, and his Bible in his hand. Guys, this is how bad it was. I'm standing in my kitchen, and I'm listening to that song as I'm probably pouring myself another cup of coffee. And I saw that picture of him standing on the stage, and I fell on the floor, flat on the floor, and began to cry out, God, I don't know of any granddads in the faith like this. I don't know of any men like this. Let me get to, let, there was just something in him that just began to bring hope. I said, but Lord, you, you can put men like that in my life. God put that man in my life. God said, boy, I'll show you what I can do. Just to, this, is, this is what God can do. And uh, I watched his story, Faith Like Potatoes. I watched the documentary, and I said, if he comes to the Western Hemisphere, so here's the thing about it. Not that there's anything wrong with preachers and men of the cloth and everything but i got to a point where i thought i'd heard it all and you couldn't people would try to give me books and tapes and i couldn't hear it anymore i wanted to i just couldn't hear it anymore but god knew what i needed to hear so he brought a farmer from south africa who digs in the dirt who has calloused hands and he came to murfreesboro tennessee and me and tim knight Dwayne russell and steve travis my brother-in-law drove out to see him But here's the thing about it on all this, all this. See, God is faithful. God does not forget. God had this weekend set up. Because what what happened to Daryl was, and I've said this before, is when I got saved, I really thought I sold everything and bought the pearl at great price. You know what I'm talking about? The 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 scriptures were Jesus, the the parable. I'm the man who found the treasure in the field. <laughs> and I sold what little I had. <laughs> Didn't have much. <laughs> but God says, you can buy it, son. And I bought it. I was, so, I was so fired up for Jesus. Even though I didn't know, not would know what I was doing with the youth, I wanted to know so bad. I just didn't know. But I tried. My heart was there. I tried. But through the years, through my own stupidity, Satan, the lies and disappointment, this is how I say it, the enemy stole my pearl, and he stole all my treasure. And I was bankrupt bankrupt but God doesn't forget my father didn't forget we're out in Tennessee and uh, just the Lord was on us that whole weekend from the hotel room. it wasn't just in the meetings here's the thing about it it was in the hotel room it was in our drive down there it was around our meals it was uh it was whatever we were doing. God was just there, and I didn't know how to recognize it. I just, there was some weird stuff going on. I do remember this, that, that Steve Travis, my brother-in-law, just got a 180. He left on a Saturday night, drove nine hours across the Tennessee all night long. Because here was Steve Travis, my brother-in-law. Christy, you better have those kids in church while I'm in the deer stand. And you better have them kids in church, the crop you're batting. I better not come home and find you didn't have the kids in church. That's how he led his family. He drove all night across the state, across to Arkansas, got to his home at 6 a.m. in the morning, went and woke up. His entire family fell on his knees in the floor and repented. They'd never seen their dad cry. For me, just a lot of weird stuff was going on. I just couldn't accept that God would accept me back. 
But I remember one time out there that the, that the Angus said, boys, lift your hands. We're going to pray for the sick. I thought, well, I thought of one person that was sick, and then I thought, I, you know, all that moment, your mind goes blank. But my son Joel at that time, y'all, some of you heard me say, some of you hadn't. God used this. Joel had planter warts all over his balls of his feet. You know what those are? Little seed warts, planter warts, real painful. They're not like regular warts. These are up in the skin. And he would come home. He was a junior in high school, and he would come home from football, and he'd pull his socks and shoes off, and he'd lay on the floor and stick his feet in there. So we looked at all kinds of things we were going to try to do and, and, and the doctor or home remedies. And he would just go, wait, 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 wait till football season's over. Don't mess up my football season. And, uh, but anyway, while we're out there, one of the things I prayed about the first night, I just clenched my hands and said, Lord, just let them fall. I thought of his feet, my son's feet. And I said, Lord, I'm trying to be faithful and strong. Lord. Let them just fall out of his feet. Let them just fall out. And as soon as I dropped my hands, I forgot about it. Because God didn't hear my prayers anyway. Um, but see, here's the deal. God cast a line to me that day. He'd already been drawing me. And out there, he threw a hook. When I came home, I'm reeling from this weekend. I start getting up every morning, and I'm digging in scriptures. I could not accept that God was going, come home, son. I couldn't hear it. I thought, I have messed up. God is ready to whack me. I'm barely going to make it, if at all. Joel came in about a, we, almost a week later after we got home. My son walked in the living room and said, Dad, Dad something's going on with my feet. And I said, what? He said, Dad, look. Oh, guys, you're going to have to trust me on this one. God is watching me right now. I'll answer for this. He pulled his sock off. They were falling, little balls were falling in the palm of his hand. And these little cuffed out things on the bottom of his feet. Let me tell you what I heard right then. Son, are you ready to come home? I'm ready. I'm ready to come home. I'm tired of dealing with me and carrying this. See, Daryl, the word's still true. Come to me when you're weary. And burdened, I'll give you rest. See, Daryl, the day I called your name, I knew you were going to go down this path. But I'm faithful where you're not. I don't forget my promises and my word. Every morning I began to get up and read and read and read. And for me, it wasn't an instant. It wasn't an instant like it is with some. God drew me out of the pit of clay. And then I found myself one day standing on the side of it. And here's what I love. He gave me back the entire treasure. Tempered with wisdom. Tempered with sympathy. Tempered with humility. And said now. And now, out of that, seeing such a rescue, there's nobody beyond hope for me. That's why we started the barn meetings, just because... A man was sharing with me one day his despair, an old man of being stuck on the shelf. I said, you're not on the shelf. You're still breathing. I said, cook a meal. I'm going to bring some guys up and we're going to tell our story. The moment you came to the Lord... All this is yours. I don't care how pathetic you think your life is right now. See, the thing that I couldn't get that I've preached so many times before is God cannot be just and let me go. There's no way. He can't just let it go. I need punished. I couldn't get it. It was Revelation, 1 John 1, 9. If you confess, Daryl, this is God speaking, Daryl, if you confess your sins, I am faithful. This is God speaking from heaven into any failed heart right now, into any kid that's wavered and lost out there. I am faithful, and I cannot lie. I am faithful, 
and I am just. Lord, how are you just? Daryl, you took it in communion this morning. Punishment was paid. This is why, this is why religion cannot get this. It's a gift. You don't have to do anything to pay for it. What is the condition of a gift? Receive it and open it up. You don't have to earn it. If I offer you a gift, take it. I bought you something. Jesus bought us. See, all back then, way back then when there was nothing, and he, all of us came into his mind in the day when we would live and what we would do. He knew every journey and every path and every turn you'd make. But he spoke and decreed, mine, but they will fail. I will buy them myself and free them from all accusation. How can that be? By coming and come and receive the gift that I offer. Just receive the gift that I offer. It's free. I bought it for you. See, my reward is you. We are his reward. We are his masterpiece, his workmanship. We're not doing this on our own. Abraham and David and, and, and Joshua and Moses, they weren't doing their ministry. They were the part of the plan of God. Rick Grizzle's a part of the plan of God. We're all just part of the plan of God. He purchased, put this in order. His only conditions is, trust me. If we do not lose hope, if we keep the confidence that says in the word that we had it first, Jesus bought me with his blood. I don't have to earn anything anymore. This is the grace of God. He's washed all my sins away, gone forever. My future is secure. Therefore, I have hope. Therefore, I want to go out and proclaim hope. Nobody is beyond the reach of God. So your parents move away. It's okay. I'm coming after you, boy. Though you're in the pits of despair and think you're beyond my reach, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've said it before, and you parents know this. And I used to use Joel so much. He'd be sitting here, and I'd go, that boy, I heard this before, so i just use it. God is a more faithful father than I am. But if that boy had, that boy wasn't, for, first off, he's not where he is today because of his faithfulness to his daddy. <laughs> you know how kids are. He's where he's at today because of my faithfulness to him. I'm where I'm at today because of God's faithfulness to me. But Joel could have committed every sin you can think of. He could have spit in my face and cursed our name and disowned us and ended up in a prison on the backside of the earth somewhere. But the moment he called for his dad, there wouldn't nothing stop me from getting there. I'm telling you guys, that is what I've learned of God. He is a good, good father who does not forget his promises. We can declare hope. Oh, Lord, help me wrap this up. If you called upon the Lord, if you partook his supper, if you thought about his body and what was sacrificed for you, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Now it is God, not you, it is God who makes both us, this is out of 2 Corinthians, and you stand firm in Christ. It's God who keeps me firm in Christ. In fact, it also says in there, it is of God that I'm in Christ. See, because here's how it is. We bear witness. Brandon, I was talking to Brandon here a while back. He was talking about how God took him from where he was as a hurt and disappointed little boy to now he's on fire for the Lord and trying to come up with some kind of formula. We cannot come up with a formula on how God did it. We bear witness to it. We don't explain it. God translated me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, right out of Colossians, giving thanks to the Father who qualified us, who qualified you. God qualified you. You didn't qualify yourself. It is God who keeps you firm in Christ. When you're dealing with disappointment, failure, 
sin, discouragement, anger. Take it right to Jesus. Let him deal with it. Complain to him. I remember one time when I was frustrated with my wife, thinking she needed to get it like I got it. The Lord said, you can yell at her all you want on your knees in front of me alone. I did, and it humbled me. <laughs> you know, God knows what he's doing. Amen. It, now it is God, this is Paul, who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us. And put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Because it is by faith we stand firm. It's not by trying harder. Listen, Corey Tim Boom said, don't wrestle, just nestle. Maybe it's hard for you to get. But you know how your little kids come up, who are those tough men that have a hard time nestling? Your little kid, that little boy or girl jumps up in your lap. They just nestle in. They just feel so safe and secure. Listen, it's not by trying harder. It's by faith. Take it all to Jesus. He washes you clean, strengthens you, makes you stand firm. Listen, we have a great opportunity before us as a church right now to be different and to be, be a a example in a transition from what's not typically seen also every opportunity to lord what the lord wants to accomplish today through the church is available to us there's no failure there's no we missed it you're here by god's design this is out of revelation it may be slightly out of context but listen these are the words of him who is holy and true and holds the key of david what he opens no one can shut and what he shuts no one can open I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have but little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Don't let anyone take your crown. Jesus bought it for you. He purchased it for you. You don't have to earn it. Receive it. Unpack it. Walk into this life that you have. Because listen, there's just but a very short time. A very short time. And I'm closing with this. <laughs> Too much in the back of this book. When what Jesus died for and what he purchased and what he foresaw is coming, when he says, Behold, I'm coming soon. Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end. Amen. That's our God. That's our Jesus. That's our Father who has never given up on any of his kids, none of you and none of your kids. Man, we can rest on that. Let's get engaged in what God has called us to do, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, I thank you that you're faithful when we're not. Lord, I thank you that you made a way when we didn't see no way. Lord, I thank you for the price that you paid on the cross, the gift that you've offered. I pray, God, that each one of us today would take that gift, receive it, unpack it, and enjoy this salvation that is so glorious and wonderful that even angels long to look into what we are given. And, Lord, there's such a glorious future for us ahead. Let us spend the time that we got left to honor, glorify you, and advance the kingdom of God in whatever way that you've called each one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know, last week when Craig, here's something that I, I was telling Brandon. Last week when Craig was announcing the transition, how many were here and saw the videos on the screen? Of the, of the men, here's what encouraged me. The man from Australia, the man from Switzerland, and then Paul from, from, from uh, Nashville. 
Men who are in the, I don't want to make this sound, the final stretch. (laughs) How do you say it any other way? The final stretch. Who are going, I am not going to just sit. Not that there's anything wrong with a fishing pole or a camper. Hear me? Hear me out. Hear me out. I am going to spend this time in my life when I have been through it all, seen it all, seen the futility of it all, but got more wisdom than I've ever had. I am now going to take what God has built in me, and I am going to use it to advance the kingdom of God in whatever way that God offers. And I started to say there were three men, but there were not. There were four men that said, Lord, with what I have left, let me spend it well. And they're going to blast over that line. And I told Brandon, I said, Brandon, when I reach that, I want to be one of those men. It may be behind the scenes. It may be in the background. But it ain't with the Lord. They're going to heal. Well done. You're good and faithful servant. See, they already had a plan what was going on in America and around the world and Russia and Ukraine and all this stuff. I know what's going on. Quit worrying about all that stuff. Let me use you to plant and advance the kingdom of God in the way I've called you. The same with each one of you guys. Amen. Amen. Y'all be released. Dismissed. God bless.